Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's really an honor to be here and an honor to be in this company, needless to say. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the relationship, as I see it, between science and human values. Uh, and this is the subject of my current book, The Moral Landscape. Now, many people think this relationship is somehow problematic, uh, usually because they think that the universe is parceled into these separate quantities. On the one hand, we have facts, which obviously science can deal with. But on the other, we have values, which inconveniently for us cover the most important questions in human life, and it's thought science really can't touch these. Questions of right and wrong and good and evil, uh, questions about really, the, the, really the, the, que the core issues of how to raise our children, what proper goals we should strive for in life. Uh, and it's thought that while science may be able to help us get what we value, it can never tell us what we ought to value. And I want to kind of push this intuition around because I think this is an illusion. I think the, the split between facts and values is an illusion. And I think it's quite a dangerous one to be taken in by at this moment in human history because it, we're in danger of waking up in a world where the only people who are absolutely sure that moral truth exists will be religious demagogues who think the universe is 6,000 years old. And they'll, they'll be sure that these truths exist because they got them from a voice in a whirlwind. Uh, so I actually think the, the connection between facts and values is actually quite straightforward and philosophically uninteresting. And, and for that reason, we could ignore much of what has been said in moral philosophy over the ages. I think values reduce to facts. They reduce to facts about the well-being of conscious creatures. And if you just imagine a universe where there are only rocks, clearly there, there are no values in this universe. There's nothing that can care about change in the universe. The moment you get conscious minds that can experience change, then we can talk about changes that matter. We can talk about right and wrong and good and evil. We can, can, we can talk about this because what there is to value are changes in experience, to the degree that experience can change. So if we, if we care more about our fellow primates than we do about insects, as indeed we do, it's because we believe they're laid bare to a wider spectrum of changes in experience. Uh, and I think we're, we're right to feel that way. Uh, we're, we're right to have our moral intuitions track the possibilities of experience. And if, if you doubt this, I would just ask you to consider, imagine a universe in which every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. Okay, I, I call this the, the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay. The worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Now, if, if the word bad means anything, it applies to that situation. Now, if you think that the worst possible misery for everyone might not be bad, or it might be good in the end, or there might be something worse, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and what's more, I'm pretty sure you don't know what you're talking about either. <laughs> now, this, this, it seems to me, is the only philosophical assumption you have to grant me. The worst possible misery for everyone is bad, and everything else, every other possible state of the universe is better. And given that the experience of conscious minds is a natural phenomenon emerging out of the way the universe, the way the universe is, and is, there, is constrained by the laws of nature in some way, then there are going to be right and wrong ways to move along this continuum of possible experience. There are going to be right answers to the question of how to avoid the worst possible misery. And it'll, it'll be possible to be wrong in your efforts to avoid the worst possible misery. And that's all we need for a science of morality. Now, some of you may be concerned that, th that this notion of the, the well-being of conscious creatures is not well-defined enough. Uh, and I get, I get a lot of um, mail along these lines. I get you know, people write me emails saying, well, you're, just, you're saying that well-being is a value, but you haven't proven that it's a value. Uh, and I get emails like, you know, who's to say that if you wanted to torture every conscious being to the point of madness, 
that's not as good as any other strategy. You, how could you prove that? Um, think by analogy of physical health. Okay, physical health as a concept is very loosely defined. It's a truly elastic concept which changes as we make breakthroughs in medicine. Uh, you, when the statue was carved, life expectancy was 25 or 30. It's now 80. If we ever re-engineer our genomes in such a way as to live to be 1,000, our expectations of health would change markedly, and yet we can have a science of medicine without tying down the definition of health. And what you don't get, you don't, you don't get pushback, skeptical challenges to, to the philosophical foundations of medicine. You don't get people saying, well, who are you to say that health has something to do with living a long life free of pain and debilitating illness? You don't get someone saying, well, how, how would you convince someone with terminal smallpox that he's not as healthy as you are? And yet I, I get precisely this challenge. And my, my link between morality and well-being uh, and, my, and my description of a possible science of well-being seems open to the challenge, well, how would you convince a member of the Taliban that throwing battery acid in the face of a little girl isn't good? We, the, we don't have to convince a member of the Taliban of that. We can't convince a majority of the American population that evolution is a fact, and yet, yet biology thrives. Scientific truth is not predicated on convincing everyone. Now, this is true even of the, the least value-laden claims about the nature of reality. Think about water. For 150 years, we've known that water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. What do we do when someone doubts that claim? When someone comes into the room and says, well, that's not how I choose to think about water. Okay. Imagine a, a biblical chemist who comes in and says, well, chemistry for me is whatever fits the book of Genesis. Okay. Well, the, all we can do in that case is appeal to scientific values. The, the, the most basic scientific fact relies on the value of understanding the universe the value of respect for evidence. I mean, what evidence could we put forward if someone doesn't respect evidence? What evidence could we put forward proving that they should? If someone doesn't respect logical consistency, what logical argument can we put forward? And so too with parsimony and, and intellectual honesty and mathematical elegance in other areas of science. I mean, this is, these are values. Science is in the values business. So the most basic facts about the nature of reality can't be asserted without a tacit appeal to value. So the valuing, uh, avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone doesn't seem like a leap. And clearly there's a continuum of facts that relate most directly to human well-being about which we can, ha we we can form true or false beliefs. And, and there's something to be understood about how we can escape a failed state, for instance, as Somalia uh, is and was. This, this photo is from the 80s. But uh, I mean, think of Congo at this moment, where everyone's daily concern is avoiding being raped and killed by drug-addled soldiers. There's, there's something to be understood about how societies fail, about how people fail to collaborate. And movement on that continuum is non-random toward a place very much like the one in which we're living at the moment. And this, the requisites of human well-being can clearly be understood on many levels. We're talking about the genome, we're talking about states of the human brain, and we're also talking about economic systems and political arrangements. But each of these levels, granted they're, they're, the, the details are complex, each falls into one of the, the familiar bins of science. We're talking about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. This captures the, the, our possible discussion about the real causes of, of human and animal well-being. And so what I would ask you to consider is a moral landscape where the peaks correspond to the heights of human well-being, to speak of our case, and the valleys correspond to the lowest depths of misery. And one thing to notice is that there may, in fact, be many peaks on this landscape. There may be many equivalent but dissimilar ways to thrive. But there will be many more ways not to be on a peak. I mean, clearly, there, there can still be right and wrong answers about how to move in this space. And when you admit this, you have to admit that some people are wrong 
about how we should live in this world, which is to say some people care about the wrong things. They care about things that reliably lead to, to needless human misery. And it is not unscientific to say that. To, to, in fact, to withhold that judgment from the point of view of science is, is tantamount to saying we know nothing about human well-being and we, are, we will never know anything about it. And that, I think, is at this moment in history a, an intellectually dishonest thing to do. And I think it's actually a failure of compassion given all of the unnecessary misery in the world. Thank you very much.